Okay, welcome everybody to the April uh, Virtual Planetarium and we will start off as we always do with the planets and we'll begin with the innermost planet which is Mercury. Now Mercury reaches superior conjunction on the 2nd of April when it appears to line up with the Sun on the far side of its orbit. So that means that Mercury won't be visible at the start of April. Its re-emergence into the evening sky is pretty spectacular though, the planet appearing bright and distancing itself from the Sun rapidly. On the 8th of April, Mercury shines at magnitude minus 1.6 and sets 35 minutes after the Sun. By the 12th of April, just four days later, the setting offset will have increased to 60 minutes, which is pretty good, Mercury having dimmed slightly to mag minus 1.3 by that date. This pattern continues over the following days with Mercury reaching greatest eastern elongation on the 29th of April when it will appear separated from the Sun by a respectable 20.6 degrees. And on the 29th of April, Mercury will be shining at mag plus 0.4 and sets 135 minutes after the sun. That's pretty good, isn't it, Paul? It is. I don't think it gets much better than this for Mercury, actually. No. Uh, I think this is a good time to, to really try and catch it. I'll probably try and catch it in the uh, in the daytime sky. And uh, you stand a good chance of doing that when it's at magnitude minus 1.6. Um, that's really quite, quite bright. So this is a really good time to catch Mercury. Um, on the 29th of April, uh, it actually sits 1.3 degrees south of the Pleiades Open Cluster. So uh, that's quite a, a nice thing to, to look out for. Yes. And this is the solar system's innermost planet, of course, and it never goes very far from the sun. And that uh, phenomena Pete talked about where it appears to rush away from the sun and then fall back towards it, um, that was why it was named Mercury, after the messenger, because it always appears to be fleeting around the sun so very quickly. It's like a moth flying around a flame. You always have to try and go one better, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> don't they like them? Although, with the seeing, it probably does look like a moth. A celestial <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it does. <laughs> I drew a moth. Uh, a view of Mercury at the end of April through the eyepiece of a telescope will reveal it as a tiny crescent. So that's really well worth going for when it's sort of a long way from the sun. And with an apparent diameter of eight arc seconds on the evening of the 30th of April, Mercury will appear 33% lit. So that, that's quite a pretty thing to pick out. And even with poor seeing, I mean, Mercury should have a decent height, shouldn't it? Because it's, this is a good position for Mercury in the spring sky. It is. And it, it's, uh, even with poor seeing, though, you'd be able to see the, uh, the phase. You'd be able to see the crescent. Yes. So uh, there's definitely this is, a, this is the month for Mercury. Um, moving out to the planet Venus, which unfortunately isn't quite as well placed as Mercury. Uh, it's also a morning object, but it doesn't rise to a very good altitude. No. And at the start of April, uh, it's magnitude minus 4.2 and it rises 80 minutes before the sun. But by the end of April, it's dimmed a bit. It's now magnitude minus 4 and only rises an hour before the sun. So um, it's not very well placed in the sky at that time. I mean, you'll see it in the, in the twilight. It's unmistakable, but it will be very very low down. It does um, have some nice naked eye events actually. It appears near um, even dimmer Mars of course. Mars is at plus 1.1 and Saturn is plus 0.9. So both of those planets will appear near Venus um, at the beginning of April but the headline act occurs at the end of the month when Venus will appear very close to magnitude minus 2.0 Jupiter. In fact, on the 30th of April, Jupiter and Venus will appear separated by just 41 arc minutes, which is pretty, pretty narrow. And that figure will drop even further as we head into May. On the 1st of May, it'll, there'll be 23 arc minutes across, so that's less than the apparent diameter of the Moon. Oh, that'd be quite nice. So you'd be able to get them both into the field of uh, your of your telescope then, presumably. Yes. So that's, that's a nice yes. thing to look out for. Um, unfortunately, from the UK, though, uh, both planets uh, never attain much altitude before sunrise. Uh, moving on to Mars, further out now, uh, magnitude 1.0 and 0.9 Saturn converge uh, at the start of April, they just lie 19 arc minutes apart in the morning sky on the 5th. Um, unfortunately, though, even though Mars rises 80 minutes before the sun, um, it's still very low from, uh, from the UK skies. And a low altitude and a small apparent diameter do not make for much to be seen on the red planet at the moment. No, I think the best way to find um, Mars and Saturn is to actually to use 
the bright planet Venus as a navigation guide. Um, Venus appears 7.3 degrees to the left of the faint appearing as seen from the UK on the 5th of April. Um, so that's that's your best way of locating those dim planets in the haze just before sunrise. Yeah. Well, moving out to the outer planets now, uh, Jupiter sadly is poorly positioned in the morning sky at the start of April. Um, it rises about 20 minutes before the sun at the start of April, but by the end of the month that has improved a little bit. Uh, it's magnitude minus 1.9, so quite bright, and it will appear above the eastern horizon about one hour before the sun starts to rise. So yeah. 30th of April is the best time to catch it. I should say, though, it will be quite well placed uh, later on in the year when it returns to the evening skies. In fact, it will be best placed than it has been for a good number of years because yes. it's slowly climbing up uh, back into the northern hemisphere. But we've got a little while to wait yet before that happens. Uh, the same is true with Saturn, of course, which is now gaining height um, compared to recent years when it was so low. If you had a, a tall tree or hedge at the end of the garden, you probably would have missed it. <laughs> or a fence. Um, or a fence, fence. <laughs> yes. Or a blade of grass, indeed. Um, but Saturn is currently a poorly positioned morning planet as well. Um, it appears very close to Mars and um, Venus, as we mentioned earlier on. Um, but... It's it's just not in a very good place. I think the best way to view Saturn and Mars and Venus is to catch them with the naked eye with binoculars at the moment and catch those close conjunctions which are occurring because they, they are quite interesting to watch. And it's interesting to watch how the shapes change between the planets as they sort of dance around in the morning twilight. Yes, yeah, so those are some nice events to watch out for. Uranus, um, unfortunately now past its best, uh, it slips from view this month because becoming uh, quite difficult to see against the uh, yes. against the background sky. Um, given a flat west-northwest horizon, however, a slender 6% waxing crescent moon uh, appears to sit just 1.3 degrees from the planet on the 3rd of April, although the altitude of both of these objects is going to be quite difficult, quite low. So there is uh, a little bit left to see of the Uranus, but we're really coming to the end now of the Uranus uh, opposition. Neptune, although a morning planet, is really not viable for observation this month. No, it's not. It's interesting, actually, with, with Uranus being close to the moon because um, that will actually become a prominent feature towards the end of the year when there are a couple of lunar occultations of Uranus which are fairly well placed. So that's something to look out for and something not to tell the clouds. No, it's too late now. They've heard you. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple of specials this month. Um, uh, on the 8th of April, there's a chance to see the popular Claire Obscure effect known as the Luna X and Luna V formations. These occur in the evening. Um, these are the sort of two floating letters that can be seen quite near to the moon's terminator. Uh, they should be fully formed and easily visible by 2053 on the 8th. That's 2053 UT on the evening of the 8th. Yes, they, they are quite, they're nice targets to look for to give people a, a reason for looking at the moon, the X and the V. And they do stand out pretty well, actually. They appear, as you say, close to the Terminator, but they appear to be floating on the dark side of the Terminator. They're, they're not... They're not that obvious. They're quite small, but they are obvious once you've seen them, I suppose. That's the best way to, to describe them. Yes, I think so. Uh, on the 22nd, we have the annual Lyrid meteor shower. This reaches its peak on the 22nd. Um, the shower radiant, though, is low as the sky darkens, and it climbs to its highest point just as dawn is starting to kick in. So yeah. uh, that's a bit tricky. Although the last quarter moon shouldn't interfere too much. Um, as it rises, as the sky starts to brighten. No, actually, that's not bad for the Lyrids. Um, they'll probably be quite a nice thing to look out for, because, of course, we've had a dearth of meteor activities since the the Quadrantids, which I think were clouded out for me. Um, but the, the Lyrids is the first major shower to occur in the year after the Quadrantids. So it's something to look out for, something to look forward to. Yeah. Um, and um, you do get some nice Lyrid meteors from that. Um, it's also worth mentioning, we've, we keep going on about the planets and how they're migrating into the morning sky. Well, there's quite a nice parade of planets forming. If you go out on the morning of the 24th, for example, um, 
in order of greatest apparent distance from the Sun, you've got Saturn, Mars, Venus and Jupiter all in a line. Oh, that'll be nice, just before they vanish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's good. It's nice to watch out for. OK, well, let's move on to the stars, because April's an interesting month. It's the transition month, really, as far as the sky is concerned. Um, we're getting yes. lighter evenings now. The dust twilight is now beginning to envelop those winter constellations. Orion and Taurus, they're practically gone now. Yes. Um, Orion's belt almost appears parallel to the western horizon. I always think that's a very strange sight when you see it. It is, I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> it's unusual. Um, and that only happens for a short time at the start of the month, but as the days pass, it becomes more and more difficult to spot this familiar pattern that we've had in our skies for a few months. And then by the end of April, Orion's gone completely. Yeah, well, con conversely, in the east, later in the night, you can catch a glimpse of summer to warm you up with the giant inverted flower pot shape of Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. Climbing ever higher in the eastern sky, Ophiuchus, but um, it's it's like a void, actually. There's <laughs> You've got a sort of rough outline there, but not a lot to see visually inside it. Um, look to the northeast and the giant northern cross formed by the wings, tail and neck of Cygnus the Swan are also coming into view, which is a sure sign of summer. It is. And a little to the west of Cygnus, of course, is the constellation of Lyra of the Lyra. And that's all that contains the brilliant blue-white star Vega, which was once used as a reference point of the magnitude brightness system. It was, yes. It, it represented magnitude zero. It did. And if you run a line between the star at the top of the Northern Cross, uh, this is Deneb in Cygnus, uh, down through Vega and extend it for the same distance again, um, you'll come down to the famous keystone asterism, which marks the constellation of Hercules the Strongman. Yes. Well, if you locate the two stars that mark the western, or that's the right-hand side as we're looking at it from the UK, edge of the keystone, and look from the top of this line, about a third of the way down, if you have dark skies and keen eyesight, you might be able to see the fuzzy patch that marks the location of Messier 13, the great globular in Hercules, which is a wonderful sight in the telescope. Have you ever seen it with the naked eye, Paul? Actually, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not sure. I, 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 if I'm not sure, I'll say no. No, I don't think so. I've seen it a couple of times. I saw it from Wales um, in, under very dark sky conditions, and I saw it from Selzy under dark sky conditions. So it is visible with the naked eye. But binoculars show it as a sort of greyish patch um, it doesn't really resolve very much with m13 but a telescope if you put a telescope any size of telescope on it it looks fantastic yeah uh, even a small telescope will resolve the outer stars yes and uh, and then uh, bigger and bigger telescopes will uh, show more and more detail and resolve it down to the core it's often one of the things I do when I finished observing in the spring and summer as I normally finish off on M13 just to take a little look at it, because I think it is a very pretty cluster. Although, as as we proved last last month, Pete, M3 is probably better, but M13 is still delightful. They are interesting objects to look at, actually, and it's off, they're often described with larger um, apertures that when you do have a larger aperture and you look at a globular, you can resolve the entire globular. That's very misleading because what you're doing is you're resolving the outer stars and the stars which pass across in front of the core uh, with respect to you, so in line of sight of the core, but you don't resolve the core. The core is still so densely packed that you can't really pull that one apart. Yeah. So it's a misleading term. It is, because uh, and you can tell, because if you look at the core of these globular clusters, you can see it's still an unresolved patch of light. Yes. But it's speckled by those stars. Mottled. Mottled yes. by those brighter stars that are immediately in front of the core. So you're quite right, Pete. It's, a, it's, it's not true that they're resolved right down to the core. But, of course, an image will do that. Uh, an image, yeah, I guess so. But it's even... But with a larger telescope. Even then, it's starting to... You've really got to go some to get all of those stars resolved. You, it's, they still tend to merge into an individual mass because they they appear so close together that any seeing effects are just going to blur them. Yes, true. Okay, well, moving onwards now, once you've found the keystone, um, you can move your gaze to a midway up about 45 degrees in a southerly direction, and here you'll find the constellation which we mentioned last month. This is Leo the Lion, yes. who in mythology was killed by Hercules as one of his 12 labours. Oh, I like um, this... this uh, 
mythology. That's the legend states that the lion had impenetrable skin. So Hercules' task was to kill the lion and return its skin to prove he'd done it. Um, and he couldn't, nothing would penetrate it. So in the end, he had to stick his arm down the lion's throat and throttle it from the insides. And then to uh, remove the skin, he used the lion's claws as knives. Ever resourceful. Oh, oh dear. Poor lion. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite violent, isn't it? Oh, the mythology is horrendous, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, dear. So there's, that's Leo the lion. Uh, probably the most recognisable feature in Leo is this sickle asterism, which looks like a backward question mark, which is punctuated by uh, the brightest star in Leo, which is Regulus. Yes. And the tail of the lion is marked by the star Denebola, which forms a sort of triangular group with Delta and Theta Leonis, which marks the cat's rump, I guess you could say, marks a bit of cat's <laughs> rump. Well, with Denebola as the point, the triangle points down to this bowl-shaped collection of stars, uh, which makes up the constellation of Virgo. This is part of the bowl of Virgo. Yes. And the region between Denebola and the, bo and the bowl of Virgo is the realm of the galaxies because of the vast number of galaxies that can be found here, which make up part of the Virgo cluster. Well, there are two clusters there. There's the Virgo cluster of galaxies and the Coma cluster of galaxies, which is slightly to the north. But it, it is an impressive region to scan with a telescope. There are misty smudges of all shapes and sizes. And there are quite a lot of Messier objects here, actually. If you want to tick off the Messier catalogue, this is the place to do it, because <laughs> there are quite a few there. Um, but we've also got the giant elliptical galaxy M87, which has a magnitude listing of plus 11. Um, to locate the main Messiers in this region, locate the star that marks the eastern or left edge of Virgo's bowl. And that's a, a lovely star name, this one. Epsilon Virginis, which goes by the name of Vindemiatrix. That's a nice. That's a nice good, name for a, good name for a cat. I wouldn't know. Imagine calling that out at night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. And draw, <laughs> draw a line between it <laughs> and Denebola. And roughly halfway along that line puts you in the middle of the galaxy cluster. And it's just worth taking your time and slowly scanning along this imaginary line with a low-power eyepiece because it gives you a wide field view of view. And so long as you've let your eyes get properly dark adapted, you'll really enjoy picking out those myriad fuzzy patches. Yes, and when we say dark adapted, that I mean that takes some time. Um, 20 minutes at minimum least, in darkness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe even 35, 40 minutes. Uh, and, and also don't be in a place where you can see light. No. And don't do something silly like, oh, I've got a planetarium app on my phone, I'll just look at that, because that will destroy your dark adaption. Yeah, or indeed, putting on the phone. Anything that creates stray light, best avoided to get properly dark adapted. Just, just to cover that, actually, there are some apps um, which have got a night vision mode you've just got to be careful that nothing else happens on your phone like as you're as you're looking at the planetarium app a a message comes up and somebody saying um you know have you it's seen clear tonight ha have you seen <laughs> bit <of> beatrix <laughs> <laughs> so yes best uh, best avoided if at all possible um ursa major the great bear is located very close to the zenith so almost overhead at this time of year and if you follow the arc of the tail of the asterism known as the plow or the saucepan as pete normally calls it this marks the bear's backside and tail and if you follow that round you'll come to the brightest star in the northern half of the celestial hemisphere. Get it right, the brightest nighttime star oh. in the northern half of the oh, celestial. Oh, it's not going to be the brightest daytime star, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you will you will be picked up if you say it's the brightest star in the northern half of the sky. Somebody will say the sun is brighter when it's above the celestial equator. I guarantee fine. it. All right, okay, fine. <laughs> anyway, it's unmistakable because it's a bright orange star. It's a bright orange star, yes. <laughs> Arcturus in the constellation of Buertes the Herdsman. So okay. that's quite a nice star to look at. Uh, very striking. It is very orange in colour. OK, well, as we have winter to the west, summer to the east, and spring well and truly centred to the south, autumn gets the worst deal of all because it's located very low in the north. Take a look in this direction. The distinctive constellation of Cassiopeia, the seated queen, can be seen hovering about 20 degrees up in the north. Um, this constellation is well known, of course, to UK sky watchers as it lies in a region of the sky where the stars never appear to pass below the horizon. They're said to be circumpolar. And um, the, so the, just as we've got recognisable shapes like the saucepan or the plough, whatever you want to call it, 
The W of Cassiopeia remains visible all year round as it circles the North Celestial Pole. But what's nice about Cassiopeia at this time of year is that it's the right way up. It does look like a W, because sometimes it looks like an M. It, or, or even the capital Greek letter Sigma when it's on its side. But yeah, It does, yes. yes. But at this time of year, you're quite right. Uh, it's, uh, it looks like a W and is the right way up and easily recognisable. Well, that's uh, plenty to see in the April night skies. We wish you all clear skies and good luck in finding some of the interesting events we've got this month. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, Paul.